We knew we had to do a, a kind of a cheap movie. We had certain restrictions. It had to be uh, very personal and a very small crew, and it took five years. Good bad taste always makes you laugh in a different way. It has some wit involved. He's making a very different film than one of them. The head of the studio uh, called me up and started screaming at me. Every edit is a political act. Filmmaking 101. Don't talk about it. Show it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. No, you didn't go to film school. Right. Why? Um, I think a, a, a weird combination of things. I think that there was, a, I, I, it was my plan in high school that I wouldn't go to film school, but then you know, a couple years out of high school, when I wasn't instantly directing a movie, I started to kind of panic and, and thought about going to film school and even did go to NYU, enrolled in NYU. At first what happened was I couldn't get in anywhere. So when I couldn't get in, because my, my grades in high school weren't very good, so I couldn't get into college. And so what it did was create this attitude in me like, I don't need film school. Anyway, because you've got to find some way to justify why, you, you know, and make it feel good to yourself. You can't get into college, you know, so you just start saying, well, that's bullshit, you know, anyway. <laughs> but then I started getting really nervous. I needed something, and I needed help, and I, 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 I enrolled in NYU, and I went there for literally two days. What, what happened was I walked into this class, and the, the, this teacher said, you know, if anyone is here to write Terminator 2, just walk out. Just get out of the door. And I thought, well, that's just not a good way to start. What if I do want to write Terminator 2? What if someone sitting next to me wants to write? You know, he was sort of instantly saying, you know, we write serious films here, you know. Terminator 2 is a pretty awesome movie. <laughs> um, so he said, yeah. So there was an assignment to hand, there was an assignment to write. It was you write a page um, that, 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 that has no dialogue in it, right? But you got to make sure that uh, you, you explain something about a character. You show a character trait through action with no dialogue, right? And I had read this, this, this uh, great script by David Mamet, which was Hoffa, which was not made at the time. And there was a great scene that Mamet had written where Danny DeVito is driving along, his character is driving along, and it shows what he's going through by the method he uses to keep himself awake while driving, which is he lights a cigarette and he holds it between his hands and he lets it burn down to his fingers to keep him burning, him, burning his fingers and keeping him awake. That's just so simple and perfect and lovely and it's, you know, Mr. Pulitzer Prize himself, David Mamet. So I took that page and I handed it in. And, uh, <laughs> and it got a C plus. <laughs> and I said, all right, now I know I'm right. And there's a wonderful thing that if you drop out quick enough, you can get your tuition back. <laughs> So I, 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 I had had this money that my father had put aside some college money for me, you know, and I sort of, you know, very suspiciously took that money that had been, and I just lived off that and made a short film. Lived in New York? Not for long. I got, got, got out of there and came back home, back to L.A. You just not like New York at all? No, it's just very hard to live in New York with no money. It was much easier for me to live here with, with, no with, money. Or, with, no, with a little bit, you know, that I could make a short film with. And the first, tell me about the short film. It's called Cigarettes and Coffee, and it's, it's okay, you know, it's okay. And it's got great actors, and Philip Baker Hall is in it, you the, know. The so. ubiquitous Philip Baker Hall. Yes, you bet. So it was great, it was great to meet Philip. You How'd know? you meet him? Now, how'd that happen? I was working as a PA on, um, I, it's like a college campus reenactment story thing. I don't remember exactly what it was, but he was playing a professor who had gotten involved with some some scandal on campus and the docudrama thing. I don't know what it was. It seemed everything that he'd done. And I went up and I just said, so I'm a really huge fan of yours. And I really, I said something totally preposterous for, for a 22-year-old jackass PA to say, which is, I'm going to make you a star someday. I'm going to make you a star. <laughs> and he was just like, you know, A, I've heard that before. B, get me coffee. <laughs> C, who are you? Who are you? But he, he let me give him the script, and I gave him the script. and. And, you know, and I thank God because he's just my favorite actor and one of my best friends. Now, what's it like when you're working that hard? Tr basically, when you're making a short film, you're really just trying to, like, make sure you don't run out of money and or film before you get the thing done. Mm -hmm. What's it like to do that with actors who you have that much respect for? 
Oh, it's 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 it, it's great because they're making up for all your mistakes. You know what I mean? You can you you're, it's the first time out of the gate, so you're screwing up the lighting and you're screwing up the shots, and you are not well prepared. But at the very least, the acting is great. <laughs> you know, it really and that's probably you know when I look at the short film, I just, oh Jesus, okay, I'm clearly learning and I'm screwing up all over the place, but it can survive and just sort of sing a little bit because the acting is so amazing. Do you know what I mean? Even though I was working against it because I was shooting it so poorly. I really learned about, about acting from, from Philip Baker Hall, who was truly the, the, the real first actor that I got to work with. So, What do you learn about that in terms of directing an actor? I mean, what do you learn from him? That the script basically gives him his preparation? Exactly. You know what? You learn like... It's so hard to, to go through in detail, but just... You know, the lesson that I learned was like, write it really well. You know what I mean? Write it really well. That's directing, is writing it really well, so that directing is just sort of being a fan and, and, and kind of watching them and loving them and monitoring every once in a while and reminding them to keep it simple or, you know, just making sure that you put the camera in the right place to see what they're doing. You know, it's just, it's just, answering, it's just answering a question that they might have. That's, the, that's sort of a directing job. If they have a question, answer it. Otherwise, just shut up. Is it okay to not have the answer too? I mean, just oh yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, that's something, that's something, that's something that I had, took a little while to learn because, you know, when an actor asks you a question, you know, you sort of jump to answer even if you don't have it. You know what I mean? When I was young, you know, like, oh, yeah, that is, that's, you know, and you just wing your way through it and you just make something up. But what I realized, what is it? It's, it's great to, it's great to, to, to say I don't know. It's great to say, you know, I'm, I'm confused. You know, because you can let them work it out too, right? You can let them work it out, or you, you know, and sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's sort of a, 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 a flaw of, of some actors to really, really know exactly what they're doing. Do you know what I mean? You want them to come in with a plan, but if they're too boxed in, to, to, to it, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna end up being tight. I don't know, something like that. Well, Philip Baker Hall, for instance, wanted to know, does, does Jimmy know? You know how Jimmy says, I don't know what I've done. And Philip wanted to know, you know, am I lying or, 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 or do I not know, you know? And I just needed to kind of dodge the answer. It's one of those where you just, you just sort of dodge it. You dodge it and just let him kind of go. And you need to get some takes where you, you haven't addressed it. You need some, you know, that's a great thing. It's just, it's a movie, so you get to, you can do a bunch. If you have not answered the question, you can get takes where you, I have not informed him in any way, and he's out to sea for a little while on his own. And I can be up front with that, just like, you know, we need to do some takes. Because then we can progress to the fact where I can tell him, okay, here's what I think. And if you want to play that, you can. And then we can get to takes where Philip can say, this is what I think, and I'll play this. Does that make sense? Sure. I okay. mean, obviously, you write for actors, you write for him, you right. write for John Riley. Do you did you write uh, the part for Tom Cruise? Yeah, I did. I'm, uh, yeah, yeah. He, um, I went to he call, he, uh, he was a fan of Boogie Nights, and it was that was great, you know, because he called me up and he said um, I was going to London. I happened to be going to London to to make to promote Boogie Nights, and I went and met him. And I got to go to the the set, the Eyes Wide su uh, Shut set. And what was that like? It was amazing. I met Stanley Kubrick, which is like meeting, you know. Stanley Kubrick. You know, the king, yeah. So that was incredible. And I got to meet Tom, and he said, you know, just let's maybe, you know, I, I've, just, I've always loved his stuff. Just thought he was fantastic. What do you love about him? I mean, because you don't think Tom Cruise is an independent film, obviously. He's just fun to watch. He's just always been great fun to watch. And, and, I, and never, um, I never felt, I felt the, the, the movie star thing in the best possible way. You know what I mean? I wanted to sort of see if, if he was as wonderful as I thought. I, I, I could not figure in the fact that he's the biggest movie star in the world, you know what I mean? And he's coming to show up and be part of an ensemble, and I think we just, you figure out the best way to approach that and, and do that. And which is what? Which is, honestly, how we introduce him in the movie. Just a technical thing, like, uh, we introduce him in the movie, he's on a little TV screen, you know? On a shitty TV screen with shitty lighting and a bad infomercial set doing an infomercial. And it sort of instantly takes the rug out from under the world's biggest movie star, who should have a big movie star entrance. You well, exactly. Know? You're taking, using the awareness of him being Tom Cruise exactly. and working against and it. And working against it. However, delivering the movie star entrance with the most 
incredibly over-the-top movie star entrance, hopefully of all time, with 2001 playing and, you know, flexing his muscles and... <laughs> but, you know, I don't know why I've, always, I've gotten hooked on this thing of how characters are introduced in movies. I don't know why. I don't know where, exactly where it comes from, but just it was always interesting to me to see, like, how someone enters into a movie. How they, you know what I mean? Like, that's the first time you see them. Give me an example, one that was just really struck you. Tom Cruise's entrance in, uh, when, you see, when you first see him in The Color of Money, you know? And he's just sort of, as, as, you know, sort of ridiculous. And, and he's playing the video games, you know? And, he's, and, and, and that's just sort of wonderful. You, you hear him at first in, in that movie. And then you're just sort of like, what the... Paul Newman keeps looking over his shoulder. It's sort of wonderful. And what was the first <laughs> entrance you were aware of writing? The first entrance I was aware of writing? Yeah. You mean writing for... Um, writing for a movie. I mean, the thing you said... You know I'm what? I'm going to write an entrance. Yeah, uh, it was... Um, I was writing an... En you know, really, I was writing an entrance for Philip Baker Hall, and it's the first shot of Sydney, which is, as his... Can it was It's sort of an, a mystery entrance. In other words, it would be the back of his... his uh, the back of his coat his back, basically, and we'd follow his back, and we'd get to hear that beautiful voice off camera without, with looking at John Riley, and that the first moment we'd see him would be blowing up the match. And tell me what your first meeting with John Riley. Oh, it was great. I was great. I was great. I'm so in love with John Riley. I've always been in love with John Riley. Ever since I saw Casualties of War, which is his first movie, I realized that it was the first thing that he'd done. And then he kind of had this quick series of movies come out with Sean Penn, you know, and I was a really big Sean Penn fan, so I was, John Riley, John Riley. And then, so I, I, I wrote the, the part in uh, Sydney for, for John, and he just called, called me on the phone and said, I'm John Riley, I hear you're looking for me, you know? I said, I, was, I, I had this song that I was singing after I hung up the phone. I won't sing it out loud, but it, the lyrics just repeated. John Riley's going to be in my movie. John Riley's going to be in my movie. I, I'm not going to sing. There's no way. So we met at this bar. We met at this bar that is actually a lot like the Smiling Peanut in this movie, the, the bar that Henry Gibson is at. It's this place that I, my dad and I went to a lot. And he just met me there, and we just talked and talked and talked and talked and just hit it off. I mean, it was like, I just, I just love him. Tell me, first of all, the title, Heart Aid. Oh, Jesus, you're opening a can of worms, man. Um, that is a, truly, actually, a very, very, very long and painful story. But the bottom line is, is that the name of the, name of the movie that I made is called Sydney, uh, And it was retitled by the distributor and the company that paid for it as Heart Eight, which sounds like heartache. But then if you make it Heart Eight, it just sort of sounds like a porno movie, you know? Um, so there's that, and I, the reason that it just happened, what had happened was that they had made a cut of their movie, uh, the, the cut of the movie, and they'd called it Hard Eight. They'd sort of taken away from me. I eventually got a cut back, had my cut, which is the thing that was released, ultimately. But I said, so mine's called Sydney, and they said, well, ours is called Hard Eight. Well, eventually we'll go with yours, but we're going to call yours Hard Eight. And I said, no, you're not. And they said, we're going with ours, and it's called Hard Eight. So it was the one battle in this entire massive battle that I had to fight to regain control of my movie that I lost. It was at the finish line. And I don't know whether it was out of spite or whether they really wanted an extra shot on Showtime where Heart 8 kind of fits as a title. <laughs> or what? You know what I mean? I, you know, on Showtime, it's always hard everything, you know. Hard justice. Hard bounty. Hard targets. Two. <laughs> So, I prefer to call it Sydney, but I've, I've come to enjoy Heart Eight as a title a little bit. A little bit? Just that much. Now, <laughs> now tell me about, you know, about, the, uh, about Dirk Diggler. Who did you want to play that like, before you got to Mark Wahlberg? It, Do you have anybody in mind at all? Yeah, it's, I'd start out with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, and I thought it, he chose to do the Titanic instead, which, you know, good choice. <laughs> But I thank God I met Mark, you know, because I think Mark is fantastic. I mean, Mark's certainly my first choice now, you know. I just wonder, if you're, as you're writing it, you know, I mean, you weren't thinking of DiCaprio as you were writing the script, were you? Not really. I mean, I, he popped into my head a few times. That, that was like one case where I wasn't really writing for one specific actor. And I had enough kind of wonderful real-life characters to base it on without yeah, having to depend on, on, on an actor that I was writing for. Well, speaking of actors you write for, too, you got William H. Macy. Yeah. Just love that guy. Oh, how can you not? The first time I saw him was in House of Games, in the Mammoth movie, you know, when he's in the Western Union office. And he's just, just cracked me up. And then I'd see him keep cropping up with Mammoth movies. And then he started to filter off into other people's movies. 
and I was so excited. And then there was a weird part of me that was so, so excited, but so sort of jealous when Fargo came out. I was like, oh, I wanted to do that. I wanted to make him the star of the movie. But it was great because it created a situation where you can go, Bill Macy's in my movie, and then you can get money for it. And that's kind of a great thing and very, very rare. So other people are kind of doing your work for you, building, building them up, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, but, but you could get the jealous director thing where you're just like, oh, I wanted to be the one who gave him a cool, big starring part, you know? You must have written a part for him in Magnolia. Yes, I did. I did. I kind of, I thought, you know, I thought that I, Macy does something really well, and I kind of wanted to cater to that, but hopefully put something new in there for him. He does confusion really, really well. <laughs> um, but I wanted to also put a kind of emotional pitch in there, maybe that sometimes Macy gets a little bit shy to go to, and I really wanted to kind of to really press him to, to, to do that scene in the bar there, which I, I really think he pulled off well, which I think is lovely. And, you know, I, it was fun to kind of make Macy, to get Macy to, to a real emotional place, a crying place, quite, you know, that's really what I'm saying. Is, Sure. And uh, it, Macy's not a big fan of doing that kind of stuff. He, he likes to, he, he loves to have it all straight ahead. And I love to throw him curveballs. You know, it's great to throw him curveballs. But he responds to them, obviously. Oh, totally, totally. He tries to dodge them at first, and then he starts catching them, throwing them back. Yeah, totally, totally. And then you just, he just runs with it. Then he just starts loving it. And you hear about the Altman influence. You've got him in the scenes with an Altman actor, with with Henry Gibson. Henry Gibson, who's from Nashville and Long Goodbye. Yeah, Henry Gibson, I wrote that for Henry Gibson too. I didn't know him, but I thought, you know, boy, it would be great to get Henry Gibson. I mean, these movies, I, I guess I remind a little bit of Raymond Carver and Altman with Shortcuts. A little bit of the player too, but they're all movies, these three movies of yours, about fairly, or characters, if not desperate characters, then certainly characters in desperate situations. Yeah. I wanted to try and create really big and desperate situations out of Really just, just like everyday and simple things, like no guns, do you know what I mean? And no, no, nothing, nothing, like making a big moment out of whether or not I'm going to take a phone call from, from my dad, do you know what I mean? Whether or not I'm going to, you know, going to the bathroom. You know what, um, I saw a movie called, I don't know if anybody saw it, it was just When the Cat's Away. It's such a fantastic movie, and it was so inspiring to me. It was so small, and it's just about this girl who lost her cat. I mean, it's just a movie that just came out a couple years ago. A little French movie, yeah. A little French movie. And it's just, a, she lost her cat. She has to find her cat, you know? And after making Boogie Nights, I was just like, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. And I just started thinking, I started writing down all of these simple things. I, I kind of got it carried away. It sort of became something else here. But... I did start out with like, you know, uh, I, I'll keep the list to myself, but it's sort of, you know, like getting a coal sore, you know what I mean? Like you can't find your car keys. Like these things can be stories. These things can be just simple, simple situations because they will always lead you to, in some way, some bigger, emotional, more confused, elaborate, because when the cat's away it becomes ultimately about this girl sort of finding her way into this community, you know, and getting out of her house. Get out of your house, even though you're getting out to find your cat, so it's kind of full of shit at first. Thank God you have, because you've got to meet people in your neighborhood and shake their hands and let them help them search for your cat. I mean, that movie plays like a fairy tale, and the way this does, too. I mean, yeah. You, you literally start with fairy tales. Yeah. And then it, you start with these, the detail that builds into, like, the bigger fairy tale stuff. At what point did the book of Exodus come into your hand? Okay. Well, honestly. Yeah. Uh, honestly. You want the honest answer? Yeah, we're here. Okay, I didn't realize that that it was that the play that the Reign of Frogs was in the Bible until I finished writing the script and I sent it to Henry Gibson. And I sat and I went out to lunch to dinner with we all went out to Henry Gibson's house in, in Malibu, Malibu and he's yeah. got this great spread and it was so wonderful because we all smoked cigarettes so we just all smoked like chimneys and and he handed me this Bible and it was earmarked with a, a green and white polka dot you know, bookmark, and I was like, oh, Henry, this is great, and it instantly as he handed it to me, I knew, I think that there's a rain of frogs in the Bible, and I am so stupid that I don't know it, but I'm going to have to pretend like I know that, <laughs> um, and I did, in fact, pretend like, oh, this is great, and I looked, and I just said, great, Henry, this is great, because I, I wanted to be smarter than I was, really, <laughs> and uh, 
So then I sort of started to do the research on that and realized, yeah, okay, it's in the Bible. But I'd first come to it through Charles Fort, who's a great writer, really cool writer. and um, He wrote about Rains of Frogs and Fishes. Well, that's, that's a different kind of yeah. thing that he writes about. Though. Yeah, he, he, it's a very different thing. And then what happened was we were on a game show set. We were doing the game show set, and we were shooting the shot of the bleachers. And I just thought, you know, remember whenever you see like a ballpark, like a game, you know, there was somebody got a John, John 316. 316. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it sort of looked like this audience. It looked like, you know, it was an audience shot. It was like a ballpark. And I just thought, what's that verse in the Bible? And we just sort of looked at Exodus 8-2. There it is. So we had somebody hold up an Exodus 8-2 sign, and then it became a wonderfully fun thing to sort of plant them throughout, you know, the movie. I mean, if, you go, if anybody has the desire to sit through this mammoth thing again, you can find eights and twos Awful. everywhere. It became a really fun kind of thing that we'd just, we'd, we'd all screw with each other, just like, you know, you'd hide them on the set and see who could see where they were. Uh, I would say, people, you have questions, please come to the microphone. So you got one right here. Okay. Yeah. And the song Wise Up by Amy Mann. Yeah. How you came to the conclusion of using that as the major thread, because I know that's from Jerry Maguire. Yeah, it's from Jerry Maguire, but it was never in the movie, which, is, which was great for me. Oh. Someone, another director's mistake, Cameron's mistake, was my, you know, big benefit, I think. It was I, amazing. Yeah, she had, she, uh, I had heard that song a while ago, because I'm, because I'm friends with Amy Mann, and it was, was great, uh, who's just an amazing, amazing, amazing artist, and, and one of the greatest songwriters I, I've ever heard in my whole life, I think, and, and she wrote this song called Wise Up, and I had heard it, and then she's, and I didn't have any sort of real, attachment to it at that point. I hadn't written Magnolia, but she gave it to, to Cameron Crowe to put in Jerry Maguire. He didn't end up using it. And I was really happy because then I was writing Magnolia. It truly was one of, it was not something that I planned on doing, a sort of musical moment. It was one of those things where uh, I've been listening to Amy's music over and over and over again. You know, you just have music playing and Wise Up was playing. And it's just one of those things you just start typing it, like, okay, they're gonna, she's gonna start to sing. The words and then are you just really keep powerful. Going. Oh, what's that? The words are very powerful. Yeah, and then it's, you know, it's just serendipity or something coming together in this great moment. And I remember that I told Amy about it, and she's just like really embarrassed. She's like, this is never going to work. This is so <laughs> stupid. And, and I, I, I was really happy. The first person that we shot of doing that was Julianne Moore, who was just, you know, if you ever want to do something weird, just start off with Julianne Moore because she can really pull it off, you know? And then it was great because I think the crew was a little bit like, well, what's this musical number we're going to do? <laughs> and then Julianne just rocked the house and then everybody saw Julianne do it and they were like, oh, okay. Okay, so that's how we're going to do it. Okay. So they were, they were all very, you know, a healthy actor competition, you know? of how they were going to sing and pull it Is that it off. thing of getting them to respond to the other people in the movie? Exactly. Oh, yeah. Believe me, this, John Riley is very upfront about sort of visiting the set when, like, Tom Cruise was doing his scenes and Phil Hoffman just like, oh, okay, that's, that's what they're going to do. Okay, that's cool. I don't shoot for another couple months, but it's great to hang out. You know, he was, <laughs> he just, bullsh he was just checking them out, you know, just like, Phil's crying. Okay, good. <laughs> Shit. You know, all right. <laughs> They just see him go work on his new plan. Like, oh, maybe my maybe my character could cry more. You know? Do you think? No, I'm kidding. He doesn't. How tall is it to get him to dance in Boogie Nights? Oh, not hard at all. You just say, action, go, John. Okay, John's dancing. John, cut. John, you're still dancing. John, you don't have to dance any. John is like ham and cheese. <laughs> I'm just like. John, you, John needs to, the only yeah. The only direction I've ever gone is just like it's okay. You, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. <laughs> I can do it with my pants off, really? You don't want to? No, John, you don't have to do it. Hi, you talked Hello. about um, how important character entrances are. What about their, their ending and their ending beats? And I know in Boogie Nights yeah. you have the, the most amazing ending beat to the film. Yeah. But just, you know, the specific characters, how do you determine their ending beats, and especially in post-production when you can change it and determine yeah. a different last shot for the film? And, this film, how did you come up with the ending beats for the characters in this film? This is actually a movie that started with its ending. The, sh the final shot of Melora Walters is the very first thing that I thought of when I was, before I started writing. I just thought of Melora's face, smiling into the camera. I just, I know her real well. She's a great actress and a really good friend of mine. And I just saw that image of her smiling and looking into the lens and, and, and then instantly sort of started thinking of Philip Baker Hall as her father and a sort of a strange relationship that they had. So that, that 
that image of Melora. As far as every other character, you know, um, hmm, you know what? I never really know. I never really, really, really know how a movie's going to end when I start writing it. You know, um, I'm really interested in your writing process, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit, like, kind of tell what a writing day is like for you, or how you go about it. Sure. Um, it's I write very, very early in the morning. I wake up really early about like 5.30 or 6 o'clock and I can really only write for like three or four hours. Um, it's just I have a whole bunch of rituals that I kind of do for myself and um, I can only write for about three or four hours I think and I think it's because I smoke so much and I don't, uh, I just get tired from smoking so much. I just I smoke constantly and I, but I'm going to try and quit at some point. So. Is that part of the ritual really important to you, the smoking part? Yeah, I'm going to smoke. Please go. Okay. Uh. Um, <coughs> Um, it really is. It totally is. It totally is. Well, as you it light up, we'll like... Oh, do, you, do you outline or do you just start... No, I don't. Random? What I do, I, 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 st I write uh, lists like of things that I like or things that I want to do or the actors that I, you know, just it really is. It's like that. And this started out, I wrote, I wrote the budget, what I thought the budget was going to be. I was because I thought five million bucks, small. You know, in the valley, and I wrote Rain of Frogs, Melora's Smile, Jimmy, Jimmy Gator. I had that name in my head for Philip Baker Hall. Just list the this, the that, that, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the Tom Cruise character's name, you know, and like a little piece of dialogue. Just lists, 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 lists. And then the list just starts turning into more, more. The lists are turning into paragraphs. And then as soon as it sort of like could become like a book that I write, it starts making itself a screenplay. I just sort of start writing it as a movie. Let's thank Paul Thomas Anderson. Oh. Thanks.